Uh, Erev Tov, uh, good evening, everyone. It's so lovely to be together, those here in the library at the Beit Midrash and, and those online to come together for this author's night at Orzarua. And I am so delighted to be welcoming Anne Goldman. Thank you so much. It I'm is, delighted to be here. It, it, it is really a treat. I will, uh, I will tell all that Anne was so generous to respond to an email that I wrote, having been entirely inspired reading the first pages of her book. You know, some books uh, you want to read and some books uh, you just start to write on the, on the cover page. And I just started reflecting on so much of what you had to say and and, and one of the first things that you said to me was that you were looking to celebrate the awe and wonder and accomplishments of great Jewish thinkers and artists and orchestrators of the modern era, really, as opposed to spiraling down into the lacrimose history of the Jewish people. And, and that's cool in and of itself, because we try to teach not only the history of Judaism, and, and now we're in the three weeks, so we have to recognize that, you know, we're in this mode of thinking about the, the lacrimose and, and the destruction and the, and, the, and the sad chapters of history, but we teach a joyful Judaism. We embrace uh, our Judaism here, especially at Orz, where we, we, we share in the simcha of our tradition, and we lift, and individuals here lift it up. So, Call it the atomic age of Judaism here at Orzerua, or in general, okay. the atomic age that we're a part of. Um, I think this is really a wonderful, wonderful book. If you didn't buy it yet, I highly recommend getting it and carrying it everywhere <laughs> in New York and reading. And uh, I'm going to start with welcoming Anne, who's also new to New York City. She just moved from the West Coast. And 40 years she was wandering in that desert. <laughs> and now we've we've got her in New York City. And so, uh, and okay, that's enough from me. Please uh, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your inspiration for this book. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of you for being here. Those of you who are here in person and those of you who are here online. Um, and I want to thank you, um, Rabbi Scott Bolton, so very much for reading the book um, so attentively and for your um, interest in, in my work. That is um, a wonderful thing for any writer, and I, I so appreciate it. Um, so the, the book was um, a long time in the making. The essays were written over a period of about a decade or so. Um, the titular essay, Stargazing in the Atomic Age, was actually written first, so it, it operates a little bit like an overture, even though it's not the first chapter in the book. Um, but once I'd written that, um, and, I, and there are forays in that chapter, there are connections that I wanted to make between math and music, um, between painting and physics. Um, and um, I had a few goals, I think. One was, um, I didn't quite realize how much of it would be about my own family. Um, and I have a writer friend who said that sometimes in order to write about family, um, you, you, look, you look farther to people at a further remove to kind of get a sense for your own family. So I think that's in part what the book is doing. Um, my father in particular, um, who died actually just um, um, 10 days after my 50th birthday, and whenever I say that, it always sounds like how inconvenient of him to have, <laughs> have died right after my 50th birthday as if that was, but, but you know, it was, it was, um, it was such a, a watershed and so, so difficult. I'm, I mean, in retrospect, I'm happy that he got to work um, right up until the end. You know, he was he was thinking, he was very excited about some new ideas, like the day he died. So I'm very grateful um, about that. But he was a very vital and exuberant person and a real character. And so he's really informed um, my way of being in the world. And he was an excellent teacher. So although um, both um, my daughter and I are um, 
in the arts and humanities, my, my household growing up was very much a science-based household. And my dad sort of loved to talk about how things work. So I, I think um, one of the things, and to, to go back to sort of the lacrimose school of history, um, I would make a distinction, I think, between um, things that are anguishing and, and sad. I mean, we, we can't really disavow that. And then being lugubrious, like all of the time about these things or keeping them or feeling that we have to keep them so much front and central that we almost sort of worship the sadness. I don't want to be worshiping the sadness. Um, and it's extraordinary to me. And that's really what got me going with this book. How many um, of the folks that I ended up writing about were um, taking their developed many of their most brilliant achievements within a period of about 15 years, um, sort of circling spanning um, World War II. And it's just astonishing to me that while um, being displaced, many of them, um, or growing up in the US, but having their families be, uh, having been displaced, being in the middle of a, a, what really felt like um, was uh, an apocalypse for Jews. It really was, we all know that, um, that they were still able to take joy in their work and in thinking and that that, that, that the faith in thinking was, was um, an antidote to, um, to despair, to not giving to despair. So that was one of the things that, that I was thinking about. And then one of the other things was actually that as a literary person, I felt like um, there, can you guys hear me? Good, okay. Um, well, that totally broke the ice, which is really good. <laughs> um, but as a literary person, I felt like I, I wasn't able to um, think through and learn from different fields the way I had as a child. I mean, I can remember, uh, you know, learning about rocks and, you know, it must, mm. I don't know, it was in grade school, right? These are learning about photosynthesis in grade school and, or reading through an encyclopedia of art. So I thought, well, I want to think about how people um, across the arts and sciences think and what are some of the commonalities. And I also wanted to teach myself to learn a little bit about these other disciplines. So those were all some of the drivers for, for this book. Well, I, I think you brought to life these incredible larger than life personalities, and then you brought them down to earth. And then you got us back into the, to the stars, right? <laughs> and so there's this, there's this going between the, the very feet on the ground, heads in the cloud reality of these very, very important figures. I, th I think it'd be worth it to just tell people in very short form, like who, who the major figures are who you, who you addressed in the book mm -hmm. and, uh, and why. And maybe if you want to do that after you read some, and you know we're going to hear about some of them, but you, we may, maybe not get to all of them. Right. But uh, there's so many wonderful ones that we could go through a little bit and say, you know, why these? Mm -hmm. And and I think they define they definitely define the age we live in. But there are probably a few more, right? And so, how did you come upon those individuals? You know, or do you want to read first, or do you want well, to? Well, I can say a little bit about that, and then I'd be really, in, you know, some of it is. Um, you know how when you there are particular people you read and you you feel you read their work and you you feel so connected that you feel like I know that person. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you don't know the person, you know their work, but there's still that sense of of intimacy. And so when I was working on this book, there were certain characters. I think of Bello, Saul Bello, as a writer. Um, I think of Gershwin as a musician. Um, I think of um, Feynman um, as a physicist. These were people I felt like I knew. I just sort of, I thought, well, I can predict the way they're going to behave, which of course was very arrogant and smug of me. Um, but so I was attracted to them. And then later I realized um, it had to do with, in part, just their way of approaching thinking, their way, their, the way that they continue to relentlessly ask questions, their, their irreverence about bureaucracies and about um, human hierarchies and their yearning um, for mystery. So that was sort of the way I went about it is there were these people who I feel like, but I, I know you, I, I think I know mm -hmm. you. And that's kind of a, the family connection coming yeah. through, the, yeah. the, not only from your own Jewish dinner table mm -hmm. and the and the culture you describe but the, the am yisrael high the kind of jewish spirit yeah you know, through throughout history and, and in these 
people and, and maybe it's uh, familiarity as opposed to arrogance, you know, that, that got you there. But then you discovered a little bit more about, you know, how they reacted to maybe a diagnosis or, or what they thought about when they, they remembered their father or, or, mm-hmm. or something like you remembered yours. So really, really intensely personal work, connective Jewish familiar work, and, and so much about these towering figures, intellectual towering figures in the book. Uh, so t- tonight's format is we, we, we just introduced the, the book in that way, and we heard a little bit from Anne about uh, kind of the inspiration behind this. We're unlike, a, like, let's say, I, I do a lot of listening to the New Books Network. I don't know if you do those listening but there's wonderful, wonderful forays into the works of the different authors. And uh, sometimes, very rarely, though, uh, do they read themselves and do we hear the, the literature in their own voices, the, the books in their own voices. And tonight, that's what we're going to do as the first part of the evening before we get back to some dialogue. And we're going to hear parts of the book from Anne herself. So we, we ha- we'll have it in her voice. And I'm going to now move out of the picture and, and kind of put the camera squarely uh, on Anne. She's going to be reading from Stargazing in the Atomic Age. Thank you for that lovely introduction. And I think I will just start out mm-hmm. by sitting and see how it goes. Okay. Um, okie dokie. So, More into um, the okay. I've got my prop. Okay. So can people, um, does that sound good? Or does that, can you see me? Great. Thank you, Linda. I can see your thumbs up. (laughs) So I'm going to start by reading um, um, Honoring My Father and um, the this titular essay, Stargazing in the Atomic Age, begins with the subheading, What do you care what other people think? When I was a girl, my father's behavior in the Boston suburb we lived in struck me as weird. His volatility was embarrassing. His emotionalism was out of place. He was a Rachmaninoff cadence where everyone else played Mozart, a medieval gargoyle perched atop a Lutheran church, a Mai Tai in the midst of the odorless, colorless gin and tonics that were Boston's favorite drink. When I grew up and moved away, I recognized his eccentricity for what it was, the incomplete conversion of this assimilated Jew, all quick erratic motion and nervous energy to the phlegmatic chill of New England. Where dad worked at the Harvard School of Public Health, the atmosphere was cool as the inside of a church, as were the faculty, several of whom he had roomed with at Elliott House 10 years earlier, but never dined alongside, since the university's eating clubs in the 1950s were strictly segregated. In their spacious Cambridge houses, they remained secluded, the graceful curves of high brick walls separating their jade lawns from the jangly street traffic of nearby Harvard Square. In the context of the city's strict composure, an uprightness that hoarded physical energy as if every movement were a waste of vital spirit, my dad's Jewish exuberance must have seemed shockingly flamboyant. And indeed, he was all violent activity. He screamed himself hoarse when we squabbled in the car, which was frequently, darted across streets before the walk sign, rifled wildly through the stacks of papers in his office searching for the document he had stashed in some forgotten place because it was important, huffed his way through car dealerships when some hapless salesman offered statistics that contradicted the basic laws of physics, ate too much from the party trays his Harvard colleagues nibbled from, and blew into our house at the end of the day, disheveled but triumphant as some Greek general returning home at the end of the Trojan War. Ignoring my mother's demurals, my dad typically wore sneakers on the several occasions each year when our family drove into the city to hear the Boston Symphony Orchestra. He commented with gleeful sarcasm on whatever stupidity passed for convention and took the talk of car mechanics more seriously than the abstracts of some of his colleagues who massaged their data, he felt, rendering their experiments unethical and valueless at a stroke. He spoofed Harvard's sanctimonious dinner parties in the mock prayer with which he inaugurated family suppers. Good food, good meat, good God, let's eat. And aggressively competitive, he never missed an opportunity to let the more socially conscious faculty of the School of Public Health know by example that their inherited facility among the intellectual elite could not stand up to his own uncouth native brilliance. Years later, reading Nobel Prize winner Richard Feynman's memoir, Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman, I recognized in this physicist's indifference to social protocol and his failure to suffer fools gladly, a curious character like my dad. 
Feynman too had a low tolerance for mediocrity. A physicist friend at the Lawrence Berkeley Labs remembers that the Nobel winner refused point blank to attend meetings. They were fine for his colleagues, he thought, but his own brain was too valuable to idle away in committee. This pronouncement must have met with a mixed reception, but it was delivered with his usual aplomb. The anecdote he recounted as a new grad student at Princeton might have been one of my father's own. Feynman could sniff out pretentiousness like a police dog trained to find street drugs. At Princeton, he found plenty of grandiloquence. The university was an imitation of an English school complete with phony British accents. The Masta of, and he, he, he writes it M-A-S-T-A-H, the Masta of residences was a professor of French literature spelled with C-H-A-W at the end, who invited him to a tea party at which he distinguished himself in his inimitable Jewish way. Asked whether he would like cream or lemon in his tea, the scientist replied, I'll have both, thank you. At which the stricken Dean's wife could only manage, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman. Here was dad, except that he, as all four of us children knew, would have asked for five spoons of sugar too. So that's, that's to my dad. Um, always <laughs> excessive, always exuberant, <laughs> often annoying, um, and always, always brilliant. Um, so I'm going to read, um, uh, I'll, I'll read some bits and pieces from um, this essay. I think I'll just talk through some so that we can read some of the, the others. What I wanted to do in it was, um, and it's a little bit of a provocation, was to yoke um, um, two kinds of thinking about Jews in World War II. So um, if Jews were half of the 12 million consigned to the death camps in Europe, they were also a large percentage of the scientists um, whose efforts in New Mexico would transform two Japanese cities likewise into ash. Um, and um, that does sound like a provocation, but what I, what I wanted to think about was the fact that not only to have us think about Jews as victims of the Holocaust, but as agents of um, agents more largely. Um, and so I, I think what I will do is um, I'll read a little bit about um, um, some of these folks and then I'll skip again. Um, but first um, I'll, I'll offer um, a, a short portrait of, of, of Einstein whose theory enabled the bomb, but who disavowed working on it. Turn to the image of Albert Einstein. And, th and this is, I was interested in thinking of images of um, uh, people, souls at Auschwitz. Um, their black eyes smolder, guttered fires that will flame up again at the slightest provocation of air. Turn to the equally famous image of Einstein and the accomplishments as well as afflictions of Jewish lives in the 20th century come into focus. Einstein, his Mona Lisa smile at ads with odds with the sad dark eyes, large and lustrous and fringed with lashes heavy as half drawn curtains. And then there is the sidelong smile itself, the very icon of Jewish experience with its marvelous shades of feeling. Bittersweet and rueful, lilting as the minor keyed clarinet melodies of Klezmer, a little melancholy, a little mocking, epigrammatic, knowing a smile that's ironic and romantic and pragmatic, quizzical without bemusement, nostalgic for a childhood paradise it recognizes it never enjoyed, slightly superior, but hesitant, hovering at the corners of the mouth like a watcher at the edges of a party, a flirtatious smile that mutates from seduction to sadness in an instant, a glancing smile with a head turned a quarter turn away from you, that still engages you steadfastly and squarely with the jacques that neither Jews nor non-Jews would ever mistake for mere abstractedness. The time has come to return this sidelong look with an equally searching gaze, foregoing the satisfactions of bereavement in order to examine more complicated solutions to the untenable choices history offers. Einstein, we know, refused to become involved in the wartime science that would translate his, his famous theory into its most destructive practice. But many other Jewish physicists were instrumental in the work the young Feynman saw as necessary, given Germany's militarism. Their hearts beating faster in the thin desert air, the physicists who gathered at Los Alamos waved away mourning, foregoing Kaddish as they bent their heads together in the race to solve each day's scientific problems. The clamor of the lab's cafeteria refused the myth of silence, Europe's slow procession of shades packing their bags without sound or sigh. 
The mathematical language these physicists spoke was competitive, argumentative, barely containable at presto tempo. At Norway's Norsk hydro plant, Nazi engineers oversaw the stepped up production of heavy water, water laced with deuterium, which I'm probably, is that the way to pronounce it? Ah, thank you. The hydrogen isotope whose denser molecular structure releases neutrons that moderate and control the reactions that split uranium atoms. Learning of this effort from a Dutch colleague who had been expelled from the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute, Einstein wrote a letter of warning to Roosevelt. The president did not immediately pay attention to this resident alien of whom the FBI pronounced in the early 40s. This office would not recommend the employment of Dr. Einstein on matters of a secret nature without a very careful investigation, as it seems unlikely a man of his background could, in such a short time, become a loyal American citizen. In the end, many scientists of his background, socialists and Jews, were invited to collaborate upon the New Mexican-based bomb project administrated by Robert J. Oppenheimer, himself blacklisted after the war. In an irony we, do, we would do well to acknowledge, it was the refugee from Hungary, Edward Teller, who later spoke most vociferously against this young American. Oppenheimer gave 20 hours of each day and some 30 pounds on an already too slender frame to the Manhattan Project. Still, in 1954, he was essentially tried for disloyalty. His security clearances permanently revoked, his legacy ineradic ineradicably blackened. In the 40s, however, the tensions between the impolitic Jewish refugee and the urbane scion of a wealthy Jewish American family were shoved aside. The escaped scientist who occupied side-by-side -side offices at Los Alamos had been spat at and despised by Europe. Above deep Atlantic seas, from the decks of the ocean liners, they watched home recede beyond the horizon line, but not beyond memory. Reviled by the countries that would forever remain their native lands, is it any wonder they chose an affiliation that made more respectful use of their intellectual gifts? In New Mexico, they substituted cooperation in what Feynman condescendingly labeled engineering in place of the pure science that gave to their lives its rare and sustaining grace. Like other brilliant people fortunate enough to find outlets for self-expression in their work, these physicists possess the ability to become so wholly absorbed in concentration that the separate antiphonies of self resolve momentarily into a single clear note. Such intellectual joy they sacrificed for a time at Los Alamos, shelving the questions and musings that surfaced at odd moments of the day to remind them of their real interests so they could, committee-like, construct a bomb. But for the refugees, particularly, I suspect, a certain degree of camaraderie, the fellowship they had once enjoyed in their own European labs until it became unalterably compromised in the early 30s, might have compensated for the temporary cessation of their larger concerns. Much scholarly collaboration is an uneasy mix of people in suspension rather than solution. The scientists at Los Alamos, with their inside jokes and Sunday walks in the canyons, their summer camp dormitory arrangements and weekend parties were fiercely competitive as only the intellectually self-possessed can be, but united in their common aim, their respect for one another's work, even paradoxically, their maverick iconoclasm. And I think what I will do um, is read, um, I know we're gonna talk a little bit about skepticism and faith. So I'll, I'll read, um, um, maybe a few um, more pages um, from this piece. Much scientific brilliance was volunteered at Los Alamos in service of weapons that remain the vanishing point for our own nightmares. But death, destruction, and the world laid waste need not be the end of the story. The same wartime refugees, outsiders like Einstein, Wolfgang Pauli, and Emilio Segre, have given the earth its location among the stars, explored galaxies at the outer edge of the universe, discovered the forces that keep the void of space from collapsing in upon itself, else no earth, no sun, no stars, no universe. Why see the faces of Jewish people as the fallen leaves of history scuttling this way and that according to an ill-intentioned German wind? At the very period memorialized by history as a dead loss, an era of unspeakable suffering whose endpoint is a mass vanishing, Jews remade the cosmos. The nadir of Jewish history marks the greatest profusion of scientific ideas since Newton, 
And these physicists pushed malignly to the edges and then out of sight of Europe altogether were central to its flourishing. The omniscient grandeur earlier centuries gave to the angels, the scientists bestowed on themselves, not as creators, but with the humility of intelligent watchers. They contemplated the beginnings of time and its end, watched as stars exploded, imploded, and exploded again, their materials coming to momentary rest in the iron of our blood and bones. Not passive, not waiting, not paralyzed by despair, the people pushed to the margins of their own townships traveled out to expand boundaries most of us could not even invent, much less understand. The destructive energy that found a language in the barked commands of mid-century wartime was nothing to these scientists positively charged masses, volatile with ideas, exuberant with the momentum of insights they knew were inescapable, unstoppable, transforming. I could not understand even the simplest physics equation to save my life, but the cocky insouciance for what other people will say conforms closely to my familial experience. I recognized in Feynman's inimitable self-possession, an ebullience akin to my father's brashness, as well as an impatience with the social rituals of the less curious who took refuge in site visits and committee meetings while he wanted only to be in the lab. Intellectual tendentiousness and a sublime lack of fear a jettisoning accepted wisdom is my inheritance too, albeit in a different academic environment than the research medicine that is my father's profession was, I should say, or the theoretical physics that is the province of so many Jewish scientists. So uh, actually, let me skip a little bit. Effortless as the body's memory and is poised, the gift of intellectual brashness opens to a kind of secular faith. The math may be performed by supercomputers in windowless labs, but still it is stargazing that catalyzes such scientific inquiry. What more spiritual than this? this unbalancing looking up at the dome of sky, your hands raised slightly to compensate for your body's tilting, your head thrown back, this open-throated but unspeakable yearning, this willingness to connect to what is beyond the self that ends in rapturous acceptance of the world's mystery. Here, the past is not a burden nor a bitterness without balm. Instead, it curves toward the future, just as looking up, we think beyond our present moment illuminated by starlight from places gone before all of us, nation after nation, people after people, began, slow as a flower's unfurling, to move from the crouch of four feet to learn the upright stance that makes stargazing possible. What more curious gift than the capacity we have of bending time, the way a few moments recalled in the lightning flashes of memory obliterate the darkness of difficult years. We'll hope for the future. Such refugee scientists show us that against humanity's timeless cruelty, ancient problems from hell translated into modern genocide, we also possess some understanding of relativity as an interest beyond our own footing. Intellectual work can move equally towards serenity as tragedy. What drives insight is not the pain of loss, but a transporting recognition that is outside of the body altogether, outside of humanness even a floating upward heedless of gravity that connects us with what the Greeks called the ether and what we still do not know to name. Science and art extend themselves hopefully as Chagall's lovers, connected by the hands as they leave the ground. And time is the key. Perhaps this is what occupies Jewish physicists in their exploration of the universe, a means to recapture a sense of time as a marvel, stretching behind us and in front of us like the seas upon which continents float. In place of the Holocaust, engulfing light and air, they listened for a wind over the darkness that portends movement, a stir of atmosphere that gestures toward presence, a quickening from absence. This conception is ancient and again modern and no more miraculous than the idea that our own universe anchored where and floating in what if not more space will itself grow to fullness to the edges of time then contract all time back into itself a trillion trillion measures slower, yes, than the memory of human life, but sure as the rhythmic rise and fall of our own breathing. So thank you, that was a long passage. So that's from the, the first um, piece. And I, I just was fascinated by the, the sense of yearning um, um, to, to continue to ask questions. I mean, in, in a way, I mean, it seems to me that 
um, many of these scientists, you know, what, what, what drives them is asking questions. I mean, of course, the point is to find solutions, but, um, but if there were no more solutions to find, you know, that, that would be, that would be a terrible place to be. So I think in a sense there, there's a way that people are still sort of groping or interested in, um, have some interest in mystery um, and are sort of groping toward illuminating a portion of that each time they ask a question. And, and that asking of questions seems to me the most important part of their work. Um, so um, shall I read from some other sessions or would you like to um, ask some questions now and then have me read later? What sounds good to you? Why don't you why don't you choose some other other that you want to present and, and okay. give a bigger flavor of the essays in the book and how they hang together, I think. Okay, okay. Um, let's see. Um, okay, I'll read a little bit from um, Leaving Russia, which is about Chagall and Rothko. And um, I cited um, Genesis um, 19, 23 to 28. So I will just read that. I wanted to think about what it was to be a Jewish painter since, you know, it's there's an interdiction to painting um, figures and people um, and what that would be, what that was like for people like Chagall who um, had a very difficult time actually becoming a, uh, a painter and whose father um, at one point um, when he asked for a little bit of money for paints just sort of threw some, threw some coins at him that just sort of rolled across the floor. Um, so I'll read this passage. As the sun rose upon the earth and Lot entered Zoah, the Lord rained upon Sodom and Gomorrah sulfurous fire from the Lord out of heaven. He annihilated those cities and the entire plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and the vegetation of the ground. Lot's wife looked back and she thereupon turned into a pillar of salt. Next morning, Abraham hurried to the place where he had stood before the Lord. And looking down towards Sodom and Gomorrah and all the land of the plain, he saw the smoke of the land rising like the smoke of a kiln. Genesis frames the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in language so matter of fact, it could be meteorological account, not story. Apocalypse requires only a sentence. In the time it takes to blink dust from your eye, the city is gone. A few more words and Lot's wife has disappeared. Abraham looks back at the dead land through air that still quivers with heat, but the writers of Genesis do not spare a heartbeat to mourn the woman's passing. The absence of commemoration may be a memorial's purest form, but vanishing haunts like neglect. In the Greek narratives that precede Judaism, renewal tempers dissolution. Roses bloom when Persephone rejoins Demeter every summer. The lilt of Orpheus's lyre calls back Eurydice. In lines of verse that stretch over story the way tendon slides over bone, Ovid, a Roman poet, reshapes the halfway human into beautiful form. Extinction translates into alchemy as a torso stiffens into a tree trunk and the glint of blonde hair trembles amid flickering leaves. The destruction of Lot's wife for obvious reasons involves no such sensuality. There is metamorphosis here, but nothing transformative. Obliterated for a backward glance, Lot's wife is permitted neither reprieve nor the solace of sorrow. Homesickness for a distempered place destroys her and then God annihilates her memory. Old Testament punishment boasts an elegant symmetry. The woman who refuses to leave without regret is fused to the place where she took her last look. The lines of, pro lines of prose do not deny feeling, they vaporize it. The soft skin of Edith's upper thigh, the warmth of her breath, the pulse beating fast in her throat and temple, all harden at once to mineral. The tears that dry into a pillar of salt offer merely a stone's grief. This economy, economy of expression is almost unintelligible in the context of contemporary effusiveness. Our public performances of desolation as of delight are closer to Greek catharsis than to Judaism's spare aesthetic. Um, so I wanted to think about the difference between the sort of Catholic aesthetic and the Jewish aesthetic. Um, I'll read a couple more paragraphs. Old Testament narrative takes the way of blind prophets who have no need for eyes. Its stories require inward listening, not watchfulness. More often, they, more often than not, they hinge upon refusal or deprivation. Grief evaporates with incinerated bodies. Sulfur leaches color from fire and rain blunts its heat. As readers, we are hostage to this writing, refuse sight, hearing, and speech. 
Perhaps an acrid odor hovers, but we must infer its trace from lines too gaunt to offer sensual evocation. The seared air tastes like gunmetal on the tongue, salt and sulfur, the materials of a star or the primeval earth. Such is Jewish artistry with language. The writing is starkly is as starkly beautiful as the desert landscapes upon which its authors lived and died. Yet by nature, its aesthetic is one hostile to visual representation. What images could illustrate the instantaneous death of Lot's wife? What palette could color the void? The story of Sodom and Gomorrah enacts the prohibition against image making as unequivocally as the story of the golden calf. Paradoxically, the simile that provides this account of destruction with its solitary embellishment transforms hearths into funeral pyres. So what I, I started with um, sort of thinking about um, the artistry of, of the Old Testament, um, of the Jewish Bible, and then I wanted to think about um, what it would have been like for Russian, for, for, for Russians, for Russian Jews in particular, but Russians in particular, to live through the early 20th century, um, the revolution, two, two world wars with a, with a revolution between. Um, so I was interested in both Rothko, who um, I think makes apocalypse understandable by investing it with the human feeling. And then I'll read a little bit um, from about Chagall, who I think operates in a really different way. Chagall, a painter born 16 years earlier in Vitesk, imagines Eden to recall us to rapture. Though he endured the Russian Revolution and the First World War and then dodged the Holocaust as a refugee, he continued to paint delight. To stand in front of his canvases is to be bathed in color resplendent as stained glass. In the face of sorrow, Chagall's paintings are joyous folk tales whose lively compositions dance to the unheard cadences of Klezmer. In the promenade, birthday, and over the village, tributes to Bella he painted in the first years of their marriage, secular history bows to sacred time. In place of blood rust, the burnt umber of charred buildings and the washed out sepia of war, Chagall selects softly brilliant hues, rose, violet, celestial blue. Color defies the monochrome of waste. The buoyant space of his paintings floats viewers upward, away from the front, the operating table, the nighttime bread lines lengthening and lengthening in the sub-zero streets. In the promenade finished during the tumultuous period of the 1917 revolution, Chagall makes Russia green again. The artist and his wife are in the foreground. The outlines of the city of Vitesk painted the color of fat summer leaves create a low horizon. Debonair as a musician in a black tux, the young Chagall stands facing us. He is smiling. One foot rests upon the edge of a ruby colored picnic cloth decorated with flowers where a carafe and a glass of wine also sit. In his right hand, the artist holds a bird. His left extended heavenward clasps Bella's hand as if her palm were the string of a balloon. Fuchsia colored, serene, she floats above him her body inclined in parallel with the emerald earth. The opaque sky is tenderer than the jade benediction of grass and houses, gentler than the coral church dome whose soft color Bella's dress curiously echoes. Lovely as a pearl, lovely as Bella, this luminous atmosphere makes your own heart rise. So that's from the Chagall and Rothko um, chapter. Um, I wrote um, another essay called Listening to Gershwin. And of course, Gershwin died before um, World War II um, began. Um, but the book is in part um, uh, a rethinking um, and an affirmation of um, another look at um, the Jewish immigrants who came over in the early 20th century. Um, and um, one of the things that interests me about Gershwin is that we, you know, so many people claim him as an American, you, you know, you don't have to be Jewish to, to claim Gershwin, but he was born um, in New York just a few years after his parents left Russia. So I wanted to think about the tonalities of um, Russian music of Stravinsky, um, for instance, um, and um, the Yiddish um, inflections of his parents' speech, along with um, the what Gershwin made of what he created, the sort of American music he he created. So 
um, I'll read a, but a paragraph of that and then maybe a little bit more of the Gershwin um, chapter. Um, hearing Rhapsody in Blue today, it takes many people only a first measure to recognize the rushed and jubilant pace Gershwin announces from the start. The music's premier performance in 1924 instantly transformed Gershwin from a tin pan, tin pan alley upstart into a serious composer whose drawing power superseded Stravinsky's. Nonetheless, the 26-year-old American was quick to claim Stravinsky as rhythmic model. Um, Gershwin linked the complex meter of the Rhapsody to the ever accelerando tempo of American life as well. Yet his indigenous music was created by a young man whose parents had left St. Petersburg only five years before his birth. No surprise, the man born as Jacob Gershevitz in New York would look to Stravinsky as a mentor. The familial conversation circulating around him as a boy was conducted in an accented English punctuated by Russian phrasings and rhetorical questions shrugged off in untranslatable Yiddish. In the brash elegance of Rhapsody in Blue, I hear the mixture of pragmatism and poetry that must have characterized that domestic speech. And as the music plays in my ears, I wonder whether in creating it, Gershwin was not momentarily returned to the sound world of St. Petersburg, city of pogrom and pleasure his parents had forsaken with both eagerness and regret. Um, and I will read a little bit um, about Gershwin as, you know, one of, so this, this essay, focus on three figures, on Gershwin, on Mozart, and then on my own brother, David, um, who died of lung cancer at 31. Um, so I was thinking about people who, who um, die very early and what it's like to have a beautiful life with a very short arc. Um, and I was fascinated by the fact that in some ways, Gershwin, so there's the memoir, there's the memoir aspect, but I was fascinated that Gershwin had almost less time than Mozart did to realize that, that he was dying. So that we have all of these modern technologies, but Gershwin sort of brushed things away um, as um, probably most of you or all of you know, um, had a brain tumor um, and um, he suffered headaches, um, went into the hospital briefly, um, for for um, did, did not um, choose to have a, uh, the spinal tap that would have um, diagnosed the, the brain tumor. And then a little bit later, he was not able to play the piano anymore. And to think about what that shift would be would be like. But one of the things that people say about Gershwin when they remember him is, um, again, his exuberance, his vitality. Um, like so many of the other figures in this book, um, he he embraced life with not just both arms, but um, with um, his whole body um, as if he had like, um, 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 you know, if, as if he was eight armed, like an, like an octopus. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, I'll read a little bit. Um, let's see if I can quickly locate that um, section in particular. Um, if not, I wanted to think about, um, um, okay, I'll, I'll read this part. Um, Gershwin's physicality worked in concert with his sound. From the pages of Merle Armitage's 1938 homage, George Gershwin, the composer's friends and colleagues insistently call attention to his vitality. Gershwin quickened the tempo at art openings, enlivened the chatter at cocktail parties, picked up the pace on golf green and tennis court. Reading these recollections, I see his lean frame thrum like New York's electrified rails, poised on its own, refusing the slackness of melancholy. If he carried himself with an uprightness a shade too vigorous to be jaunty, his smile was just serene enough to suggest it was not relish, but an openness to appreciation he invited. Arrogant, maybe, but even at 26, Gershwin knew he was creating musical structures to rival New York's inimitable energy. In hindsight, he would provide the city a high watermark of achievement before its tempo stumbled at mid-century. And during his lifetime, by and large, the country accepted his self-confidence. Despite his dark Jewish looks and lovely charcoal eyes, Gershwin became America's golden boy, spinning off million dollar hits with the same ease Mozart turned out minuets and trios. Um, and um, what, um, you know, one of the things about the Rhapsody that's fascinating is um, 
um, Gershwin had very little time to write it. Um, he, it was advertised before he had finished it. And he um, did not even have the entire um, score. Fin fin well, he had the score finished, but he had some of the piano figurations left out to be improvised, but he thought that was okay because he was gonna be the soloist and he knew that he, he knew how good he was as a, as a virtuoso. Um, so, you know, there, there were people, I think there were other musicians and composers who um, bristled a little bit at his assurance, his self-assurance, but um, that was, a, uh, that was a sort of a remarkable um, achievement. Um, so I think maybe the last thing I'll read. Yeah, we, maybe just yeah. one more a little, one more piece. And yes. Then, and then okay. we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll I'll, dialogue. Got it. So I'll read a little bit from the, um, the essay I wrote last, which is called Wonderful World. And it's about the mathematician Benoit um, Mandelbrot. Is there anyone? Well, I'll ask later during discussion, since we have to do all the muting and unmuting. Um, so Mandelbrot was born in Poland. Um, grew up in France. He um, was sent by his parents to, um, to the south of France where he survived um, with living sort of openly, but with false papers. Came to New York, um, to, to the US and ended up um, working at IBM for over 30 years. So he had this career in, so, you know, the kind of thing that Feynman would have condescended to as kind of engineering or um, practical math, not pure math, and eventually became um, tenured at Yale. He, I think, is still, um, he, he's, he died um, um, some decades ago, but I think he remains the oldest person to be tenured at Yale. And there's something marvelous to me about that. Um, that he had this zigzag trajectory and that this um, institution that some people might think of as, um, well, it's part of the ivory tower, did eventually welcome him into the fold, even though he did not have a conventional career trajectory. So um, I'll read, um, I, you know, I, I thought about what it would have been like for him um, to grow up in France um, um, you know, living in this way in, in perpetual fear of, of, of being found out. Um, and it struck me that the fact that he was interested in discovering fractals, so discovering this, that even, that even what looks like chaos, what, what he would call sort of rough forms, um, things like clouds and coastlines, even things that seem like they have no pattern can actually be, um, they can be elaborated upon um, in images and um, in, with, a, 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 with a, a formula that is um, sort of a single formula and that they do possess this kind of symmetry. It's a very um, complicated set, of, a kind of symmetry or complicated kind of patterning um, and if you if you think of my of of like ferns um, that are fractals, or if you think of um, one of my um, favorite vegetables, um, um, which um, um, I'm going to forget the name of. Thank you. My daughter is prompting me as she often does. I always think green cauliflower, Romanesco. That, that that that's that's a fractal. So so it's these recursive patterns at different different scales. So I was really interested in the fact that this is what Mandelbrot spent his lifetime working upon, um, given the fact that he grew up in so much chaos, and I mean political chaos. So I asked in the essay, did Mandelbrot explore the patterns he named fractal to cleave closer to nature? Or was the geometry of chaos he championed a way to think through the political disorder he survived as a young man? The meandering arcs of the Mandelbrot set mirror the shifting contours of coastlines and clouds, even as they repeat the branching conduits that bring oxygen to the lungs and blood to the tissues. Every portion of matter may be conceived as like a garden full of plants and like a pond full of fish, Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz announces in the Mon Monadology, that's from 1714. But every branch of a plant, every member of an animal, and every drop of fluids within it is also such a garden or such a pond. Voltaire directed his Candide to sneer at Leibniz's rosy understanding of Earth's orchard. 
But surely, Mandelbrot might have reasoned from the vantage of more than two centuries distance. The Frenchman and the German, who so vehemently disagreed on metaphysics, could agree upon how quickly a pond dimpled with rain restored the reflection of the branches arching over its surface once the shower stopped, and how unceasingly a part of every plant inclined toward constantly shifting light. What were the petty factionalism of the academy or the small mindedness of nation states compared with the faith flowers hold for the sun? So um, yeah, Fantastic. I'll stop there. Thank you so much for, for listening for so long. All right. Do you need a quick stretch? Yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. maybe. Thank you so much. I, I will Everybody, do that. Everybody, this is like you know, a little bit of that uh, intermission for right. only a second or two. Right. Yeah, the old movies where, they, where the piano player comes out and plays and there's the, the the curtain comes down yeah exactly exactly we need those musicians talking about science music art yes <laughs> so, so this gives me a, an opportunity here to uh, kind of react and reflect and hear it all again now in your voice and I so enjoyed reading all the essays. You've highlighted Einstein, you've highlighted Chagall and Rothko, you've read uh, about science, about music, about art. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned the Tanakh, mm -hmm. our Jewish Bible. You've mentioned its, its terse expressiveness and the desert landscapes that come into focus despite the economy of language. Mm -hmm. You've mentioned all of that and uh, it seems that you also you know, put a memoir in here. So it's you in, and you're sitting with all these greats. And you, as you said, you, you, it seems like you've gotten to know them mm -hmm. through their work and reading about their work. And you find that they are a source of at least the deep questions of, of Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. of, of Jewish culture, that they are questioners, right? Yes. Are they also beacons of hope and creativity or are they just asking questions and coming up with answers for the time because everything's as chaotic even if there's a little order as Mandelbrot said right. you know what I mean um wh where are we after after looking and and traveling with them knowing that they were these creative forces and powers mm -hmm. uh, in in the shadow of the holocaust that right. obviously plays a big role right in, in this work right um you know, are we the better for all of it and, and how, or is it just Jewish history repeating itself, errors of creativity, yet in even new ways, literary ways, artful ways, and we're on to another one soon, right? You, you know what I mean? Well, I, I yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, I, I think that, you know, they definitely responded to, to, to history, um, but, but that included the Jewish traditions that they, they wanted to disavow many of them. Um, I, I think, you know, when, especially in World War II, the sort of difficulty, I mean, we're, we're steeped in Holocaust literature now, but um, I think one of the first books to come out was Primo Levi's um, um, Survival in Auschwitz, and that was in the early 1950s. And at that time, it wasn't something that anyone wanted to speak about. Um, so I think there's, there's a way in which that sort of colored things, but but mostly, um, I think that 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 all of these people sort of translated the the habits of mind that I think of as rooted in Jewish, and I'm I'm on shaky ground. So you know, this is this is um, your Bailey. What so please jump in anytime. But I think rooted in in um, religious understandings in in the kinds of um, rabbinical learning. Um, and um, they get fostered across the, the centuries. I mean, Feynman relates um, a, a funny anecdote where he he um, he he's goes to um, to um, let's see if I if I can find it um, to um, a particular um, group of of Talmud students and. Right, he's talking about electricity. Yeah, right, he brought it up that he's yeah. and he thinks he's gonna he, he thinks he's he gonna, thinks he's gonna, gonna get one over. Yeah, and he's gonna right. 
talk past them. Exactly. And yet their questions and, and yes. their lines of inquiry lead to a little bit more creative understanding about what this electricity is. Well, exactly. I mean, so he thinks he's going to sort of shine that bright yeah. light on them. But in fact, he says, phooey, you know, they they they'd known about this for ages and their their way of sort of their logic, um, their way of zigzagging through the kind of um, um, scientific thinking that, that he was wanted to develop for them. He, he, he had to acknowledge, well, they 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 knew it already. So he he sort of acknowledges the 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 sort of rude, his own sort of rudeness in in these these the long centuries of of sort of argument over uh, the close reading and argument over over language um, and um, and it's and of course it's philosophical and spiritual um, underpinnings and I, I think um, there is I think that's true for all of the figures that I was interested in I think that in a way they're they have so much faith in thinking that, that that they sort of just translated that that was their way of sort of hopscotching. I mean, it, it was it was such a painful break for so many of them mm -hmm. to be wrenched from the old world to the new world. Mm -hmm. um, there was so much anti-Semitism um, um, in the new world. I mean, I, I actually think of one of my favorite writers, um, Henry James, who writes um, in the American scene about the turn of the century in New York um, mm -hmm. and the 20s and just and describes Jews as worms that can be sort of subdivided and just sort of regrow. Mm. So and this mm. this is, you know, I mean, that, that's the fascinating yeah. piece, because there are people who say that Am Yisrael's forever changed, right, that breaking with the old country mm -hmm. in all those different times, whether it was the pogroms or whether it was the European onslaught, uh, tyranny, and finally murder, mm -hmm. uh, the expulsion from Arabic lands, because we don't mm -hmm. want to forget that uh, this wide community got dispersed. Right. And Cardoza, for instance, Sephardic heritage, mm -hmm. second justice of the Supreme Court, another one of these yep. figures. You could have put a legal figure in here. Yeah, he would have been uh, good. He would have been interesting. Uh, you know, we, we have this very variegated family who then lose, in a sense, lose their religion. Mm -hmm. And yet you you do say, so it's your territory, not mine, uh, though Einstein often distinguished the work of science from the study of religion, he was aware that on one level he was translating his pre predecessor's desire to decipher the laws of God into the laws of physics. Like he was saying to the universe, that, or that the, at least the universe was saying, darshani, right, this Hebrew word that says, figure me out, mm -hmm. figure me out, harness me, right, let's move forward. And, and one of the things I love about how you saw these people and wrote these people, wrote about these people, is that you saw them in their work doing, and you try to describe it in different ways than I think have, have, has been presented before. You know, and, that, and that's really sweet. And, and you wrote yourself into their stories as much as the, you wrote them back into ours mm -hmm. uh, in, in different kinds of ways. Of course, we invited you to the synagogue, even though it says on page 21 of the book that uh, I have inherited my father's contempt for pieties. Ceremonies of all kinds make me squirm. I satirize homilies at weddings and funerals with whispered aspersions. <laughs> so, so I still that's, do funny, it. that's funny reading. That's funny reading for a rabbi. Yeah, I bet. Uh, which, which I really enjoyed. But it gets to the point that humor mm -hmm. is also one of the developments yeah. that sits beside all these other ones. You made me think a lot about the, the humorists mm -hmm. among the Jewish populations who came as well. So not only do, do, did I sit with the people in the book, but there are others. Mm -hmm. And so now I've mentioned Cardozo, I've mentioned the humorist. So my question uh, about that is, who is, who is your favorite one to write about if you, if you have one? And or are there other people you didn't put in who, who are kind of sitting on the sideline who you had an essay brewing about? You know, I, I think there are other people. I mean, I actually be curious, um, you know, to hear from you guys about people who, who you think might be figures that could sort of help um, constellate the, the figures who, who I wrote about. I mean, one of my favorite chapters is the Gershwin chapter, I think, because um, I love music and I, th I think more in terms of sound than in terms of visual images when I write. And I did want to, um, I did want to remember my, my brother, um, and so that chapter brought me back to my early days, sort of playing piano and, and viola, and just to the quicksilver way that music can change mood. And the fact that music is a 
feels to me like math, a purer language than than words. Um, um, it's a it, it, it's 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 a language of feeling, um, hmm. at least for me. So so I did really enjoy that, and I was I was just struck by. Um, Gershwin's, you know, he, he he grew up like basically in the street. I mean, sort of working class. I mean, they moved like, I don't know, 23 times or something while he was growing up. The family did. And yet he was so he was so cocky. I mean, you, you had to kind of admire it. Um, and then his music is um both the popular music and the music that we sort of like um um exalt to to the to the music musical canon, the classical musical canon, even the fact that he wrote sort of so well across both of those. Um, the fact that he took on um, Porgy and Bess, which, you know, is is a picture of black life. And I think there are a lot of people now, I mean, it'd be interesting, like, um, to think about that. I think there are people who would who would say like, well, maybe he shouldn't have done that, you know, maybe. But I think, again, a lot of these figures and sort of moving away from the question of skepticism and, and faith, but a lot of these figures um, trespass different um, borders and boundaries with aplomb. And that's that's one of the things that I think is so interesting about them that at the very time when in, in the political world, and that was happening in the early 30s. And so for Gershwin, who helped um, get Schoenberg, for instance, over to the US and other, other um, musicians, Jewish musicians um, out of Europe. Um, so they could see that these that these borders were, um, were, were closing down. And yet at the very same time, um, as, a, as a composer and as a musician, he sort of just skipped over over um, over genres and, and across eras um, and across um, cultures as well. And I mean, and the fact is that really, if you think about um, somebody like Ella Fitzgerald, she has a whole you know album of, of Gershwin Gershwin songs. So that it's very much a, mm. a, 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 a give and take. I think um, right. same with Sarah Vaughan, um, same with Cecile McLaurin Salvant, um, a favorite of mine and of, of my my daughters. Um, but it is, I, I think that willingness to trespass, you there's maybe a way that that goes mm. back that that puts us back in the spiritual realm because there's a sense of um of expansiveness, of assuming that this world is perhaps not the whole world. Yeah. The ability to just say, you know, I don't really care that somebody has said, well, you know, my discipline is physics, so why should I, what, how can I talk about um, um, music, or um, my discipline is linguistics, um, Mundell brought one of his first um, um, papers was on linguistics, and then um, he traipsed across all of these sort of different, different areas into medical research, um, th um, um, papers that have sort of helped uh, um, medical research. And he has one paper called How Long is the Coastline of Britain? And because it's, because the argument is, is it's a fractal, it's, it's kind of infinite. Right. Um, but so I, I do think that that willingness to trespass, and yeah. there is a way that, you know, you can say, some people might say, well, trespassing shows contempt. And I don't think that's the case for any of these figures. And I don't think it's the case um, in, in the terms of the spirit either. In you know, fact, what, you, know, what, you yeah. know what I love about the word trespass? Is, mm -hmm. And that is, I don't mind boundaries and borders, mm -hmm. right? As as a as a as a, someone who de, who defines himself as a Jew, mm -hmm. right? I don't mind that someone wants to take from a Jewish sensibility or a Jewish text to then use it in, you know, whether it's visual art, uh, mu music. We get the cadence mm -hmm. of the way we sing a Mishnah if they're going to honor that, right? Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of honor going back and forth between people who were interested in recreating the world for the better yeah and sharing right you you had some people who were really doing you know scheming for evil but then other people trying to say you know hey you think a ruler is a ruler you can't measure that coastline yeah, <laughs> yeah. i mean and and, and, yeah. and these were new pushing boundaries and borders together yeah and and he in the man Rod's case he wasn't necessarily accepted right away to push so far Mm -hmm. and to challenge the norms right. right but we as we, we we see that within our culture we sometimes see that um you know the the, the music we played uh, has minor scales and yet it's going to be celebratory about life like mm -hmm. how do you get to celebrating life with minor scale music but, right but you do i mean like if, again like klezmer is the perfect example yeah, of that exactly. or like the the clarinet that opens um 
that opens the rhapsody that which is both um it, it's there's a tinge of melancholy but but it's absolutely um sort of ecstatic too and and full of full of joy but yeah i mean i i think that that trespassing is ultimately more about connection um and reaching across divides and what would only appear to be divides and and i think there is that um if people are focused on the spirit is is there, there's a sense of um that we shouldn't assume that the forms that we're in now are, are like the only forms available. And right. I, I think a little right. bit about like, um, who is that? Um, yeah. And, you know, the way in which um, we're all, we, we all take for, on forms and we change as we get older, our forms shift mm -hmm. um, and sort of that breath of life, like is, is sort of breathed into yeah. us for yeah. a while. So I, I think there's yeah, we're given a, yeah. capacities to do different things at different points in our lives and, and to accomplish. And with more wisdom, we create a different painting, a different visual, a different set of words comes to express, um, you know, and, and I so respect, you know, sometimes you meet people and you just know right away, like they are what they say they are. <laughs> so like, and like you're, you're a writer, right? And, and you, you have this way with words and you put them into articles and, if you go online, you'll see like one of them that was I was so taken by was your ability to bring jellyfish and the experience of what it might be like to be a jellyfish into the world through your words. Uh, that that article was efficacious. Mm, thank you. And uh, that's that's on her website. Uh, but you wrote this sentence that I got to ask you about before we turn it over to folks and get mm -hmm. some thoughts about who else fits in this canon. And if you have uh, other reflections about the writing yourself or questions for Anne, uh, there's this sentence on page 97. And you said music was more than words. So already I can see maybe where this might go. But you said, like open heart surgery and prayer, writing and reading are not always efficacious. Yeah. So I, I want, is that because it just doesn't get where music gets now that you've said that, or do you mean something else? No, I think I mean something else. I mean, you know, when I wrote, I, I have a, an essay on Primo Levi and Dante, and I was really fascinated by the fact that, that, that Levi in, um, in the Auschwitz memoir actually invokes Dante as a way back to, to becoming human um, when he's in at Auschwitz. Um, and he recites, um, um, and he, he, so he recites actually from, from Homer, but he, there are many parallels throughout that memoir, as some of you probably remember them, where Levy invokes Dante. And there's something poignant about that because they're both Italian writers. I mean, Dante would have thought of himself as a Tuscan writer, not an Italian writer, because it was before the era of nation states. But I was fascinated by that, um, with, with the, that Levy did that. Um, so that, that was interesting, but um, um, sorry, can you sort of rephrase the, I mean, the latter part of that question? I just really want to want to know what you mean by uh, writing and reading and writing oh. are not efficacious. Well, I mean, I I, I, I mean, for, for Levy there, it was efficacious both to read Dante and to write his way back into humanity, right? But there is, again, or was this, he always looking for it and never found it? Well, you know, he tried to write himself back into humanity. That's true, and he didn't. And he kind of didn't. And when you look at the there's a collection of, of uh, short stories that, that I, I wrote a little bit about. I did sort of evoke it in short. And I was struck by the fact that, um, you know, one of the pieces, it's, it's a beautiful short story. Um, the persona the, the, is, is a kangaroo, not even human. <laughs> then there are stories with aliens, like in outer space. They all have the kind of ruefulness. Um, well, Levy, I mean, I wouldn't even call it ruefulness, just a kind of a very wry, ironic sense of, of understanding. So I think in some ways he didn't really, couldn't really write himself back in. But I, I think partly I was trying to wrestle with this huge problem of evil. And I didn't, I, I was thinking of like the Serbian dictator who also fancied himself a writer. And we think of Hitler who fancied himself a painter. So it's like, what do you do with these people who, um, these mass murderers who want to see themselves as yeah. artists. So that's where I think, um, you know, there are, yeah, there are limits. They subverted in a way. Yeah. And, and uh, not only is it not efficacious, but it's, it's a subversion of potential, you know, what, call it beauty, call it beyond expressiveness of, of not only emotion, but 
of the energy of the universe. And you, you have to have an, for, for the possibilities of life. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, it seems like you have to have an open heart and an open mind to sort of take in um, someone else in, in through reading. Yeah. So I, I, I wanted to think about, you know, I mean, I grew up like probably a lot of people. I mean, all I, all I did was read like all day. I mean, my mother would be like, why don't you go outside? And my mother <laughs> is not a, a very athletic minded person, but I would just sit in this green armchair and just, just read all day um but i mean i i think you know there i can see it olive green yeah. i can you know, <laughs> you know that old velvet yeah um, soiled armchair but yeah um i i think there are there are limits to what we can do and and that also is is good to remind ourselves of that we can't that even if we read ourselves into other lives like when i teach um i I want to introduce students to new work that they might not otherwise, that they might not find on their own. And it can, it's really different to choose books um, that where you feel like the, the, the characters are sort of like you, whether they're, whether they're mm -hmm. works of fiction or nonfiction, or whether you say, you know, for, for me, for instance, I mean, I don't do this enough. Like I should be reading books about adolescent boys because I feel like I'm far from, from, from adolescent boys in my life, but you know, you 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 want to well, have you an can, open heart. You, you can find those worlds in, in literature, and, yeah. and you can see which uh, uh, projects are are kind of invitations to get to know people, like mm -hmm. you found with the folks that you found. Yeah, and these are folks we all knew. Getting back to stargazing, um, we we knew all these people, and you took us though into their lives, and we know them a little differently. Those of us who read this, I think we know them a little differently now. And we've seen them through your eyes, and we also are, are interested in how our lives fit in to those puzzles. They're the, the you know the, the spaces they made for us, and so that's really cool. I I would like to at this point transition us into some comments. Uh, Charlie has one here in the Beit Midrash, and if you have one uh, in the Zoom world, there use <laughs> the little uh, hand below the reactions and put a hand up, and. Uh, whether you're clapping at this point or you raise your hand, whichever one you pick, I'll- Or I'll, arguing, I'll, arguing I'll, is I'll good too. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that's part of the culture. So, all right, Charlie's going to offer his uh, comment first. Hold on one second, Charlie. I'm going to move this uh, microphone and you got to speak loudly enough. And if you could just be succinct in that and- Okay, um, almost every sentence you said hit home a little bit. You got to speak up. Oh. Almost every sentence you said hit home with me. I started reading the book. I haven't finished. Um, from and in a tribute to your father, massaging the data. Mm. My uh, the head of my PhD committee was also the chair of the Department of Biochemistry at the time at the University of Tennessee. One of his criticisms of me was that I did not massage the data. <laughs> um, and um, the technical thing he wanted me to do was he wanted me to switch my statistical modeling mm -hmm. in an invalid way. Yeah. He wanted to decrease the size of the error bars. And um, wow. I don't want to go into the details of statistical modeling, but right out. I, um, I, I won't name this other person because it's too close to home and this is being recorded. Although <laughs> he, he, he's dead now, but I, I don't want to vilify the, sully the institution. But he told me one of my problems is I am too honest the about the data. So in a tribute to your father, yes. <laughs> but, um, also, my daughter's an artist. I don't throw money at her, but um, she has a good banker. But um, <laughs> so, for people to look at mm -hmm. minus home, yeah. Mm -hmm. who, um, he, to me, he's the father of modern chemistry. Mm -hmm. I can't do what I do without understanding what he contributed. Um, one of the contributions he had made was the. Um, understanding of the three-dimensional structure of protein, particularly the alpha helix. And when Watson and Crick were working on the three-dimensional structure of DNA, had the United States allowed him to leave the 
country looked Britain, he would have just looked at those X-ray diffraction patterns from Maurice Wilkins Wilkins lab and said, "Oh, alpha helix, mm. put them down," and the two we call them clowns playing with all the models mm -hmm. in order to figure out the three-dimensional structure of DNA wouldn't have had to waste their time. Um, he was not allowed to leave the country because he had gone on, we call it a tirade, um, war. And that's why he got his Nobel Peace Prize in addition to his Nobel Prize in chemistry. But he also actually deserved the Nobel Prize mm -hmm. in physiology and medicine. And since email didn't exist, he couldn't do that. Um, one of the things you did very well was cross the humanities with the sciences. I only know two other people in my entire life who did that. One was my undergraduate mentor, Elof Carlson, who might be dead now. I, I lost track of him recently because of perturbation in my life. But um, the other one to maybe look at is Jerome Rupner who's a physician, a hematologist, mm -hmm. who wrote several books. One of the things science often forgets, and medicine often forgets, and I'll name Sloan Kettering. Sloan Kettering is not very good at remembering their treating people. I, I, I worked there for a long time, and mm -hmm. other institutions, other hospitals are like that. And the human component and the biomedical research component don't always talk mm -hmm. to each other. Ewolf Carlson kept me online with he's a geneticist. He kept me online with that when I was an undergraduate and informed me about the human condition. Mm. And what actually picked that up in my life has been Judaism rabbis. Oh. They actually think about a moral you see that, Charlie? It all comes back to tradition. <laughs> let me let me ask let me ask Anne if she's got a reaction to your uh, observations yeah, and your suggestions. Your, your, your essays are packed, so I, I packed. Any 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 word on just line? So we have candidates: Linus Pauling and uh, what's yeah. I mean, Groupman. Yeah. All right. So yeah. what do you think, Anne? I I mean that makes sense. I mean I, I'm thinking also of um oh gosh I'm gonna forget his name um Lives of a Cell uh. The, I think he actually, he might have worked at Sloan Kettering. Um, I, th I think there were um, the 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 author of the Lives of a Cell. Oh, oh, uh, Lewis. Yes. Lewis, Tom, Lewis Thomas. Yeah, I mean he's actually a really humane writer. Exactly. Um, I, I think there. Yeah, I feel like there are some. It's interesting that you say that. I do think that there. Are, that there are some of the, the physicians are maybe the best at doing this. And maybe because of that terrible disjunct that you're that you're articulating, that terrible divide between the technologies, these innovative technologies, and then the the the, the fact that um, medicine is is um is is not there's very little um um kind of there's no there's not a lot of holistic thinker, there's not there's not a lot of, of recognition of the patient. The patient just gets sort of distributed into into her or his various biological systems. Yeah. 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 So maybe that's why some of these physicians have really tried to 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 work on this. Perfect. Let me get to Aaron and Diane. Do you have a so just a, a very quick we, thought. We each have a comment actually. A, a, a quick thought and, and thank you so much. You your your words and uh, and descriptions are are just beautiful to listen to, and I think we're going to have to just buy the book. Um, <laughs> but the the um, there's something very mystical and magical about what you have described, and it's it's almost like indeed reaching for the stars. And and, and uh, music and science both have characteristics that are mystical. I mean how. How do you get from here to there? And it's it's not even something you can touch. It's just it's sort of out there in the air. And and I've known and you know that it's it's clear that there are a lot of scientists who are also musicians, doctors who are amateur musicians, and they get a lot of gratification out of moving into this other realm of the music is form of science as well. And so I just offer that as a 
for your for you to comment on if you don't if you don't mind. Thank you. Yeah. No, I mean, I I've been struck by that too. Um, and I think some of it is that, you know, and I'm, I'm not really as, as well versed in music theory as I, I should be, but I think that really math undergirds music theory. And um, so that that's, that's part of it. Um, you know, I think for some of these specific, that specific figures who I was interested in writing about, I was, I thought it was striking that so many of them loved Mozart. Like, why right, Mozart? Right, you wrote that into the book several times and, and even certain pieces that they listened to. Yeah, I mean, like, Rothko basically pretty much painted only to Mozart. Um, Saul Bellow um, uh, actually gave a talk at, the, uh, at, I can't remember which anniversary, which Mozart anniversary it was, but in, in Italy and wrote a, a really lovely essay about, about Mozart. Um, Einstein loved Mozart. And I think some of that has to do less with the math component and more with, again, that quicksilver language of feeling, but also in Mozart, the fact that he was an 18th century composer and that he, um, there's so much balance in the work. Yeah. Um, so the sense of those underlying structures. Um, so maybe there's a way in which like math I think of equations and equations are have, take two presumably very complicated um, ideas. There are abbreviations about complicated systems or ideas and build a bridge between them. Mm. Um, and I, I yeah. think Mozart does in his music with um, um, when he, in terms of the, the quality of human feeling, these very fine shades of feeling. Um, and I, I, I think again, that there's something like distilled about the language of, of both of, of math and, and music. I mean, words remind me of, um, you know, when I was, you know, when people, when children carry around like blankets or something when they're really small and they, I can remember having one like that, the chatter blanket and it picked up all these twigs and this and that. I mean, words have connotations and they have color. And so they, they, mm -hmm. they, they create a lot of, um, their denotative and, and, and associative definitions, but, I think of the notes and, and of course notes have resonances too and harmonics. I mean, it's not like a note is, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a wave. Um, but I, I do think of it as a, as a more abstract language as less about materiality and more about relations between structures. Mm. Mm. Diane, would, would you so, want to add? Um, I I really appreciated the discussion of George Gershwin, who, whose music I have loved since I was a teenager. Um, in uh, a few, few weeks ago, PBS aired a documentary about Jews and their contribution to musical theater. And it was an absolutely wonderful, fascinating documentary. Um, but among the things that they talked about were Gershwin, Gershwin and Porgy and Bess, and Gershwin's writing the piece, for instance, It Ain't Necessarily So, which is debunking biblical tales. But the music is yeah. actually Baruch Hu et Adonai So it ain't yeah. necessarily so. So it's, That's it's very really fascinating. interesting to bring in that you know, piece of his, his soul, if you will. Yeah, and putting it into uh, into a musical. So uh, I, very cool. Yeah, very cool. Beautiful. I have to also say your writing is melodious. Beautiful. Oh, thank you so much, and thank you for that. Yeah. Really, for you, to both of you for your question and and questions and keen observations. That's really interesting about about Gershwin. I I do agree that Anne's writing is melodious. I do agree that it's deserving of uh, re reading it whole. And also atomistically, since we're talking about the universe, right. one atom at a time, one sentence at a time, and there's what to contemplate. And that's why I want to encourage everybody to really go back and either uh, get the print edition or the Kindle edition, whatever edition, and spend some time with it and look her up elsewhere on her website. There is a certain amount of hope and promise, despite the fact that Lot's wife turns into a pillar of salt. 
Um, maybe it's the salty tears in her eyes that were being described and not necessarily her stagnation and mm -hmm. her being cut out of the picture. That's, always, that's how I've always read that's interesting. that story. And mm -hmm. uh, you were able to both harness some of the salty tears of our age here and also the starlight that we're all made of and the stardust that has infinite promise. And so I wanna thank you for blessing us. I wanna thank you for making us your first intellectual stop or your, right. your writer's stop in New York. I mean, maybe, you know, you, you already compared notes with Zoe, your daughter who's here in the, in the Bay Midrash, <laughs> but, but we're, we're blessed to have you a part of Wars Rua now and our doors are always open to you and thank Zoe you. to you. And so thank you for coming on the Zoomosphere tonight. Thank you for being here in the Bay Midrash. And uh, Lila Tov to all. So blessed, Anne, that you're here Lila Tov, for this author's night. Thank you so much um, for listening and for your comments and questions. I so appreciate it. It's a wonderful welcome to the city. Lila Tov. Thank you, Lila Tov.